just a couple of bits of news. The main piece of which is uh, last month, Marge and I were voted on to, along with Julia Topless, to the Drupal South Steering Committee. So if you voted for that, regardless of who you voted for, thank you very much for participating. Um, if you don't know, the Drupal South Committee is not part of the Drupal Association. It kind of sits underneath Linux Australia in a very hands-off relationship. So it is very much a community run by the Australian and NZ uh, community and serving that community directly. So um, thank you if you voted for taking part in that and <coughs> helping to see that come through. We're all really looking forward to the Wellington event. I hope we'll have dates we can share with you and I hope we'll be able to see you there. Um, I'd also like to call for speakers for this meetup for next year. Um, we're going to have the December meetup, which will be at Reload Bar on December 8th. You are all more than welcome to come to that, but you do need to RSVP for that one if, you, uh, if you're the sort of person who doesn't usually RSVP for things. Um, we have a very specific headcount for that that we have to stick to, so first come, first served. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, yeah, we need speakers for this event. So we're experimenting a little bit tonight with this panel arrangement. I haven't seen a panel done at a Drupal meetup yet. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a risk. That's the theme of the panel, so that's perfectly fine. Um, if you think of something that you think we should try next year, we're gonna try and get into this monthly from February, um, or if you wanna present something of your own, um, then please let me know, um, and we'd love to have you involved. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carl, um, who is going to introduce our panels and uh, kick off the, the main event. So thank you, Carl. <laughs> thank you. So this is also new to me, so I'll be reading from a script occasionally. Uh, we're here tonight to discuss risk and how that impacts innovation in the place. And we've got a representative from some major categories, so uh, senior public servant, there's a uh, private sector in leadership, the developers and um, a yeah project manager, a public sector team. So on the far right we have Helen. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Helen Delfanti. I'm currently contracting at the Civil Aviation Safety Authority as a sorry digital project manager. Um, I rebuilt the CASA website, which went live in December last year, and I've been doing continuous improvement work for them ever since. And Alistair. Hi, Alistair O'Neill, technical product owner, GovCMS. Um, government face of things, government for a long time, about 15 years overall, um, haven't done a lot of private stuff in a very long time. Next we have Lee. Hi everyone, I'm Lee Giddos, I'm the managing director of Annex. Um, I've been doing Drupal stuff probably for, I was just trying to calculate real quick in my head, probably about eight years now. Um, so yeah, involved as a developer and also as a like a scrum master and delivery lead for tons of Drupal stuff. Yeah. And Bryn. I'm Bryn. <coughs> uh, I work with I work for Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a big risk sitting next to him today. Uh, I'm risk. a developer, yeah, it'd be manage risks. Um, I'm a senior dev and we work on Drupal projects a lot. Various things. <clears throat> okay, and I'm Carl Hepworth. I am the moderator for tonight's panel, and I worked with Previous Next managing and developing the Skipper platform, so uh, operations folks. I will be just keeping this conversation going, and I might chime in occasionally. Uh, did we want to start by uh, defining what we all think risk is? Because this can be very different depending on your background, your history. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Sorry, we're not. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, um, risk for me is resourcing, capacity, capability. I think are the big ones for me. Um, when I think of that, people always need more resources. People usually don't have a lot of capability. Um, and capacity is always an interesting one across bodies, resources, people, technology. So, um, just one moment, we're getting a low battery. That's a risk. We've got a mitigation in progress. Excellent. Yeah, 
they're the ones that, yeah, that, that's how I say, that's how I define those sorts of things. They're, they're very umbrella terms, but of course. Moving on, Bryn, follow up. Uh, so for me, I guess risk at work would be whether the project is delivered on time and sort of to budget in a general sense. I guess I don't really, Lee will take more care about those bigger things. For me, it's, yeah, right down in the roots of a project. Does these tickets get completed in the right time frames or are we missing the mark in certain areas and how can we adjust to those things? So for me, risk is a bit more like specific to a project, I guess, in this sense of what risk is. Yep. Hello? Uh, risk for me as a project manager is anything that will prevent me from delivery. So whether that's lack of resources, a lack of capacity, or trying to do something that's creating a risk for the end users on a website or in a system. So anything like that that may prevent me from trying to get the job done, that for me is my, what I define as risk. And like, yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything everyone's already said. I think the other, the other bits I always think about, like to me, everything has some level of risk. Uh, which we probably don't even think about, but you're always doing some sort of kind of mitigation. But um, to me, even even like the risk of not doing something or um, not, a, it's not even like necessarily delivering the outcome, but also the, the risk of like not getting, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, the, the, the Maybe that's part of where we're going with the innovation part, which is like, um, yeah, the, the risk of, not fulfilling the potential of like what you could possibly get or not exploring something um, as part of the product delivery. So for tonight's context, we have unmanaged risk, which is a uncollaborative effort where an individual or one or two individuals take lead and sort of go into the space where a decision could impact customers, clients or workflows. And you've got managed risk, which is a more collaborative effort. Everyone's aware of the risks. Everyone gets involved in testing and it's a bit more structured. Our first question would be, do you feel that within the workplace that risk taking is encouraged? And if it is, do you feel it's uh, accompanied by an acceptance of failure? We all have war stories. So um, take that how you will. Did you want to go first, Bryn? Sure. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Your boss uh, is right next to you. <laughs> I think, honestly, I think like at work we do a pretty good job at assessing and and sort of mitigating risk where we can. And I would say that risks aren't that bad if we kind of are open and honest about what we think those risks might be. So let's say we want to. We're starting a new project and I wanted to build with a new framework, for instance. That That is in, inherently risky because, well, we don't know anything about it usually. But if we like estimate properly and, and sort of we're just upfront about those things that could kind of go wrong or that kind of stuff, like I don't think there's any real reason why we can't take that risk. And at work, I think we do a pretty good job at allowing people to sort of be a bit more flexible when it comes to that kind of level of deciding, are we going to be able to use Vue or React or a few crazy Angular? Like there's these things where it doesn't seem like it's that risky if we just manage them. So I think at work, we are encouraged to take risks and like in this case, try new technologies and things like that. Um, but it doesn't seem inherently risky when you take all the steps to make sure that you've covered yourself and sort of you know where the flag points are of like this isn't going to work we need to go back to what we know so, yeah so, so you can say it's a, a whole bunch of managed risk have you had to deal with a manager in the same way i would suggest working with me is somewhat unmanageable, <laughs> <laughs> unmanageable. <laughs> pat and lee will probably both tell you that but usually at the end of the day i come to my senses and i'm all right so, so um, a, a collaborative approach and you basically reach a point collaboratively, decide when it's time to step back. Yeah, like, it. so Pat's in the audience, no one can see him, but he's there. He's my boss, and like, I will say to him, like, I want to try this. And he'll say, yep, or not. 
based on our time frames and stuff, but hardly ever no. And usually if it's a no, it's because it's not, not needed. But like we work at it together and we sort of just make a decision together that, yeah, this is a fine thing to try out or like let's save that for a different project where we have a bit more scope for like why we want to use this. So I have to make a bit of a justification sometimes why I wanted to use these things, but I don't think at work, at least in this job, there's much unmanaged risk. Anymore. Most, yeah, anymore. <laughs> like we, we have lots of things in place to make sure that any risk is like caught early and we're like communicating often. So those risks are brought up in just like daily standoffs and like backlog refinement and all these kinds of things where we think, oh, there's like a possibility that something could go awry here. We've sort of got all these other frameworks around them to sort of like manage the risk and make sure that we're still innovating and things like that. Fantastic. Helen, would you like to hear the question? Yes, please. <laughs> um, do you feel that within your workplace that risk uh, taking is encouraged and is there a feeling that you're, you're going to be accepted for failing and how is that handled? So I think, I don't know that risk is encouraged, it's just accepted as being part of a project in, um, and I haven't really worked with unmanaged risks because part of being a project manager is identifying the risks and understanding the potential outcomes and putting the mitigations in place so that hopefully that doesn't happen. So um, I usually work with a managed risk environment. Accepting failure is a bit of a, a juggle because the environment I've been working in for the last couple of years is I'm working for a regulator. So there are lots of legislative and regulatory things that have to be done and there's no room for failure in that environment. Um, um, and previous roles, similarly, you work for someone, um, I worked with a digital health agency um, building the My Health Record website and we had to put into place the mechanisms on the website to manage the opt-out period. And there was such a high public focus on that and so much publicity that, and the census had just failed like six months before. So <laughs> there was no room for failure. Like, so that was kind of a really scary place to be in because there was a real potential for failure. But we we just, everyone kept walking around going, you can't be another census. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's always that juggle, but risk is just a part of being a project manager. You just live with it and mitigate it to the best of your ability. And and while failures, I'd like to say failure is not an option. It's always a possibility, but you just work your hardest to not make it happen. Yep. Also, I'd um, like to hear the question again. No, I think I'm all right. A um, couple of my things reflect Helen's experience there. It's probably yes and no to the actual question. Um, yes, in the sense, I think we've got some pretty good controls where I work at the moment. We go through CAM process, we talk about change in that sort of space. We have a lot of meetings talking about a lot of things in that sort of space. Um, and we think about risk, obviously, at a security level, at a functionality level, and of course, obviously, well, what happens if all of this blows up? Um, so, of course, a lot of that is that sort of front of mind, very similar to that. Um, <laughs> When I think about some of our customers, similar again to Helen's experience, is there is an expectation that things cannot fail. Um, there isn't that room in their space, or they've been burnt before on something. And that's reflective of previous jobs of mine as well. When I, not the last job I had before GovCMS was running a corporate web team for finance, same building, um, different sort of lens, but same thing again. Um, people just expect it to work. They can't have a failover, or there's a legislative requirement in that sort of space. Um, so there's an expectation that you can just deal with that regardless of whether it's, <laughs> whether it's actually manageable or not, or even if it's a real risk. I think a lot of people worry about some of these things that aren't necessarily founded. Yes, you should have some capacity built in to be able to address those things if they pop up. But I think with a lot of stakeholders and customers, because they don't have an understanding of the technology being used or redundancies built in, or even some of those things such as our process, um, and even today, this week's been a bit of a challenge from GovCMS with doing a release. That's, it's a managed risk because we have resources. We're doing it during operational hours where we have capacity to do things. It isn't necessarily great, but we've also got rollbacks in place. 
um, whether people perceive that's a good thing um, or whether that's potentially mitigation, I'm not sure. That's for someone else to decide when they look at us and when they think of us as a product. Lee, yeah, would you like to hear the question? No, I think I'm all right. Um, yeah, no, I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, I was thinking about this one as well. Like, I don't, I don't know that we, we encourage risks as much as we maybe should, but we build safe, like we try to build safety into every day how we work to mitigate all those risks and, to, and create space for every, for all of our people to do the thing that they love to do. So like the, the last thing we want is like have a list of scope and go just only do that. Um, and you know, you kind of just work like a robot, which is often a lot how, um, how projects come to us. What we try to do is create enough space in there where you get a chance to think like, yes, there's features and there's scope and that's what people want, but you, we want to provide enough time in there for the experts to like think about the problem, maybe come up with a few extra solutions because often your scope is just the, somebody's idea of the solution to our problem. Um, so yeah, we, we, I guess we try to provide that safety so that there is time or opportunities for people to come up with ideas. And sometimes it's just like, no, sorry, client, you know, whoever whoever it is, our client is absolutely wants this thing, and that's how it is. Um, or you know, it might just be that's a great idea for like the next phase of a project potentially, like you know, because there's back to all those constraints with budget or resources or whatever. So yeah, we we just try to provide that that safety. We kind of, yeah, it's like, and I guess I'll slightly put a slight twist on the fail part, which is we definitely don't want stuff to go down, but we try to make it safe enough for you to like learn a lesson and like fail inside of a sprint or on a, on a test or like I tried to build this thing, but it didn't quite work out, but it was worth the experiment. Or we, we build a prototype, we thought this would solve a problem, but now we've done user tests, it doesn't solve a user problem. That's not failure that like we try to define that more around like we've learned something, we've saved a bunch of time for like we'd have to build that thing now. We know it doesn't quite work, or at least um, it needs to be tweaked and known like a, a known usable function or or or, or piece, yeah, piece of functionality. So yeah, that, that's how we kind of try to provide that space and maybe we should be good like like all those safeguards, maybe it's not as overt, which is like, we have all this in place so you guys can do all your things and take some risks. We don't promote it like that, but maybe we should, yeah. Can so, I just throw in one other comment? Something yeah. Bryn said about, can I try that? Mm. Yes, but in a test environment. Yeah, yeah. So like, not a lot. <laughs> yeah. Don't go near the one with the red banner at the top. <laughs> Straight into the front door, basically. They can do whatever you like at test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's... Yeah. A, a cry that I have every day <laughs> in a test environment. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sounds like we're all very familiar with uh, managed risk these days, which is a good thing to see. Is there any differentiating language that you have at work or in the workplace between managed and unmanaged risk? Do you, they get handled different socially? Or how do, are they how do, just not there? How do we define unmanaged risk again? Uncollaborative work. Right. One or more individuals working to achieve a certain goal, it might be due to a necessity. Yeah, our voice. Our voice. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. No, it's just. I say yeah. Yeah. a lot. <laughs> lack of collaboration. Yeah. Lack of collaboration is our definition. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. I mean, my environment that year doesn't go well. Like, because I'm reporting to people who have very definite ideas about what they want to accomplish, and like with scope and you know requirements and. If someone goes off on a tangent and does something weird, then it usually doesn't go down well. Do you find that the, the terms used to speak with them are a lot more formal when that happens? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what we're trying to draw down. Yeah. Um, well, the, you know, in my head, the buck stops on my desk. I'm the project manager. I'm the one that's organising the resources and trying to get the job done, organising the sprints, trying to get all the requirements done. And if something does go off the rails, then I take responsibility for that because I've either not been paying attention, or I haven't asked the right questions, or someone hasn't come to me and spoken to me about what they're doing. But either way, it's my responsibility to keep track of all of that. And if I haven't done that, then I fall on my sword. Have you found the same thing, Elle? Mm, yes, probably not so much in the current job. Um, I'd like to think, like to think we're a bit better about discovery and having visibility of things that are coming up. And of course, obviously, there's a whole lot of security requirements that go with that job. We make sure that we have to be on top of things. 
when I think about previous, it probably aligns very much to Helen's thing, where, yeah, you find out that someone's been doing something, or you find out that something's been connected to one of your systems, and then you find out because someone turned something off, or it blew up, or they've registered it in, um, in a company's name and you don't have a contact over there anymore, or they closed down because they had a certain video get um, published and released publicly, and then you have to rebuild their site. Um, three days later, as they do the next round of graduates. Um, <laughs> Paleo banana bread, if anyone's um, unfamiliar with what I'm talking about there, or just um, department graduate video. Um, so that was one of those blown effects that landed into my team at the time. Um, and of course, for those sorts of things, it was a whole bunch of process that happened that jumped through all the right hoops that you do for procurement and things in government, and doing all of these sorts of things. They didn't actually tell the team who would then own the product any of the information of how to get to it, how to maintain it, how to pay a bill for it. So in that sort of space, um, yeah, everyone but the people holding the bag were involved. Um, when you look at that specific instance, everything feels like it's above board, except for the fact that you were roped in as you as you became the BAU owner of the build. Um, but that's otherwise pretty reflective of that sort of that otherwise sort of cowboy mentality if someone goes off, builds something, and then is hoping it doesn't break because they left three years ago. Language in that case would be fairly consistent from start to finish the project, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Lee? Yeah. I, yeah, I think I'll answer this from like a high performing teams kind of perspective because, yeah, like I think a lack of collaboration causes, I think, a lot of problems in our teams. So, um, as soon as as soon as we yeah you have people I guess cowboys or, or whatever you want to call it like off doing their own thing not collaborating or not checking in with teams and just doing their own thing you you destroy trust like really quickly um, and so that has huge effects more than just like can we get this project done on time and like of course that all becomes part of a manager is but yeah as soon as you have people not collaborating then you the team second guessing themselves about what's next and 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 what was discussed and where are we up to. Um, so, yeah, we try to back to those systems and things. We try to make it as, as nice as a space inside of that team to be able to collaborate. And, you know, some of that's just being around when your teammates are around and, and, and checking in on whether you're on Slack or on Teams and this is what I'm up to, here's, here's the ticket on that. Um, and then I think the other part would just be that, like, blameless kind of culture of it's, we try to blame system or process problems rather than individuals. You know, everyone's heard of those classic stories where, you know, someone's first day where they, you know, they wiped the prod database, but, you know, are they at fault or is it the fact that they had access to that on their first day, you know? And so, like, we try to think about things like that. Like, no one really has malicious intent and, and is deliberately trying to break stuff. No one wants to, you know, ruin a project or have, a, have, a, have something come down. So we try to have systems in place back to creating that safety and then, again, Look at it as a like issues always happen, things happen, but try and look at it as a process problem. What can we change? Maybe someone hasn't had enough training, or you know, maybe maybe the meetings are on at the wrong time and you can't get to them, so therefore you're not collaborating as much as you need to be. So we try to look there. Yeah. I think just just to touch on that, Lee, I, I I'd, I'd agree because I think a lot of people are worried about getting yelled at for something, yeah. and of course that malicious intent one is a big one. You're not doing this sort of stuff because you. I mean, you theoretically like what you're doing in yeah. this space, right? Yeah. There's a level of creativity that comes with this. It's a level of creativity that works in a risk space as well. It's, there's a whole bunch of really cool things that you want to do with you. there to try and solve problems and yeah. you know, hopefully have a bit of fun while you do it. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the average punter isn't usually trying to do those sort of things. They're just trying to do their job. That's right. There's nothing like getting yelled at to then be like, cool, I'm not going to get creative anymore. I'm going to do exactly what I'm told. And I'm basically being discouraged, especially if you do it publicly. Like, if you just like, you did something wrong in front of everybody, you're never going to get anything like that. Oh, why would you speak up again? Or why would you, yeah, you'd be, can I, should I do this? You'd be, yeah, it's not yeah. good for culture for sure. Yeah. Can someone push those changes for me? I can't yep. do it. Yep. Yeah. Review everything I've done because I'm nervous as hell. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And your take, room? My answer is much the same as Lee's. I mean, we've worked at the same place, so it kind of makes sense. But I think in terms of the language, as people get spoken to or communicated with differently, um, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you have people that do that in your team and it, it becomes the case that they become 
sort of like the black sheep of the team in some ways. And they, and I guess people, every single thing that that person does from then on is sort of like viewed from this, like they're trying to go against us sort of light. And I guess the communication between like me and that, that other person, or even if I'm that person, is probably not. Like everything is a bit more, like you said, formal and a bit more like bitsy, like, this is the thing you need to do, then this, then that, so that like you, like by just communicating like that, you're trying to mitigate the risk of that person does something wild again, right? But yeah. are you just yeah. is that like you're describing like a breakdown of trust again or like yeah, something it comes yeah. down to that, right? Like if I'm working with someone and they're constantly just sort of straying from their ticket a little bit and sort of like doing their own thing. Yeah. Or like we as a team, let's say there's five members and four of us have all decided or oh, we're all on the same page about how we're going to build a site, right? And then there's this one other guy who's just doing it their own way. It becomes really challenging to work with that person because now the site's just like two sites in one and it becomes really difficult and, and that trust is broken down. But you can't, you feel like you can't even give them a ticket in some ways because you just don't know what's going to come out the other end. Um, and like Lee said, in, in, in high performing teams, that the trust is paramount. I think um, you just it just doesn't happen. Like you can't you can't have a good team if the other people don't trust each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. basically a human pyramid. And if the guy at the bottom decides to just go build circles, <laughs> just fucking everyone falls down, right? <laughs> <laughs> have you in your career found that that pattern can be reversed, where a breakdown in trust can eventually be maintained, upheld, or improved um, upon? Do you feel it's something that can be turned around? I think it depends on the person. I think it can. Like, I don't think there's ever the possibility that it's just 100% no. Um, it really depends on the motivation of the person and the, and the way that they're being dealt with within the team. Like, if, like we said, if they're being yelled at in front of everyone, there's a really low chance that that person's ever going to want to change because you've kind of just put them in front of the village and called them an idiot, right? right. Um, and that's not a nice position to be in. But I think if you nurture the person and, like, everyone just wants to come to work and do their job, like Al said, right? Like, no one, I don't think anyone ever does things maliciously and, like, maybe that one person thought that that was the best way to do it and they've just done things that way forever because... That's the way it used to work in the past, right? Maybe they, they used to work in Drupal 6 and now they've moved straight to Drupal 8 and it's a completely different par paradigm, right? So maybe there's that kind of issue and, and it's just a, a training thing. Um, but I don't I don't think it's impossible. I think sometimes it can be hard to teach an old, old dog new tricks, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think trust can be rebuilt through process. So going yeah. back to what Lee said, simple. If you stick to the process, that everybody knows what's expected and what you have to do. And so if someone breaks the process, then you just bring everybody back in. Or if there's no process there or the process is broken, then sit everybody down and say, how do we fix the process? Like, what step is it that's broken? Where is this going off the rails? Okay, everyone agrees. This is what we're now doing. Here it is. Everybody follows this. And if everyone then does that, that's how trust gets rebuilt because the person that, lost the trust or the people that don't trust whoever they can see that everyone's now you know following yeah. the rules right to, to me that requires mm -hmm. both parties to, to want to change absolutely right? like, absolutely can we yeah. say the project is manager and learn to all of us sit together <laughs> <laughs> i mean i had two developers a while back who were committing stuff different in using a different process and one was doing it one way and he thought he was right and the other one was doing it a different way and he thought he was right. And they right. kept losing work. The second one was overriding work that the other one had done and they were kept going like, ah, like I'm coming in the morning and the sky was falling. And so I sat them down and I said, okay, I need you guys to agree on the process. Like whatever it is that you wanted, however you want to do the commits, you both need to agree on the same steps so that that doesn't happen. And eventually they came to a consensus and, and did it. And while I don't think they ever got to 100% of trust, they probably got to about 95%. And in my, that was fine. That's a good outcome. Yeah. That's a good outcome. I 
been on that side of it where it didn't work out for the other party. It's just the process and your communication, obviously. <laughs> now, moving on, uh, do you feel that it's necessary to take risks or to innovate in the workplace? Yes, and no. Please, thinking. I'll, I'll do yes and no again, right. as I did earlier. Okay. Um, Yes, you should be taking risks. Yes, you should be trying new things. Um, it's a good stimulant. Um, again, goes back to that my statement of creativity earlier. No, going back to, well, don't do it in one. Don't do it in prod, don't push it up. Do it in a safe space where it can be trialed, it can be errored, it can be validated. Does it work? No, what else needs to be done to it? Do we have to drop it? Um, but yeah, don't do it out in the wild yonder. So the answer would be yes, but in a safe space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a better way of answering that. Yeah. Does everyone agree? Mm -hmm. We'll have different feedback. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to quite. I don't know exactly how to answer, it, like, like black or white. If if I just, I guess I just see everything is there's some risk in everything at some point, and so that's that's fine. Um, yeah, it's how how much again space can you create to like if like where are the parts where are the spaces for innovation where can we build that that in and then again still contain and mitigate those risks like but i think again for us we've got different clients with different needs and different budgets and different appetites for risk taking and sometimes they you know some some people see doing lots of research and understanding of the problem and discovery as like risky and spending of money and i, I just want my website or or my app or whatever it is Whereas, um, and others will see that as a necessary process to not build the wrong thing and take, and, and, you know, like that could be a risk on its own to like go live with something that doesn't actually help a user or, or solve the problem that you're there for in the first place. Yeah. Hello? Um, I think the, the things that are key in my world are preparation. So requirements, scope requirements, you know, writing it all down, understanding what is needed. But then there's that whole, I love that, there's an old project management little cartoon where they're trying to, you know, the requirement is this is what the client wants. You know, the, this is what, screen? yeah, the engineer builds this <laughs> and the developer builds this and the someone, this is what you end up with, but this is actually what they wanted. And that's a communication thing. But it's also about, you know, if you do all your preparation and, and your, your communication right up front and get, you know, then and keep that communication going, but it's not just with your stakeholders internally, it's also with your audience. Like, you know, the website we've just built, we thought we communicated a lot and then we found out that there wasn't enough, you know. And it's, yeah. So it's like I don't think you can ever do too much talking about what you're doing and telling people what's coming and this is going to change because, but it's always a risk. Everything, like Lee said, everything is a risk. It's just about trying to keep people prepared and, get them to a place where they know that there's a change coming. I agree with the sentiment that everything is risky. <laughs> Everything's a risk. I don't like waking up in the morning, stepping out of your house, doesn't matter. <laughs> there's like a risk that there's a crazy person out there with a chainsaw or like a car hits you or anything. Everything is risky. <laughs> <laughs> Like. <laughs> there's, a, there's a risk that you've betrayed Carl and he's out for you. <laughs> there's no risk of that. <laughs> you picked the wrong guy. Um, but I think the answer is yes. I think you have to take risks to innovate. Um, they should be managed in some way. Like we should flag when this is for, like, let's say I choose a piece of technology. A good experiment was we used white on a, on a Drupal project. I think we decided we may not do that again. Well, that was a lesson learned. Yeah, yeah, that's a lesson learned, but it was a risk in doing it. Like it, it worked, and for that project, it was fine, but the benefits didn't outweigh the, the problems that it caused. And that was okay. Like it was just a thing that we tried. So we, we took a risk and we tried to innovate with newer technologies, but maybe there's a more simpler, like, way to do the same or similar things not to say that we wouldn't use byte in a like in a in a project that required it like a headless front end or something like that makes sense but trying to get it to work with drupal you got to have like 
weird stuff in the theme and and stuff like that. Like it just, he had to do a lot of retrofitting to get it to work. The risk was like low because like I have confidence that we can get it to work. But like maybe the reward would have been high if we got it to work and it didn't take that much. Mm. Like we could do away with a lot of older things. Um, so in that way, I think risk really is important to innovate and we've got to try things otherwise you just yeah, stick with the old stuff and we're still on triple seven to the end of life always right <laughs> coming off back to something you said before do you think there's a place in the workplace for unmanaged risk in any capacity it could be when a, a customer critically needs attention or a developer needs things uh, or a outage infrastructure load work something more my field but are there cases for it are there cases for doing wild cowboys after the unmanaged risk is through there's a bit of collaboration a, a i think that's the weekend. important bit like in some ways it is okay to have a little bit of unmanaged risk if if <laughs> you are committed to like mitigating that risk after the fact like sometimes you have a client <laughs> and their website needs to go live critically right like we had some sites during COVID that needed to go live real quick. And then as it put them in the dev environment, like some things failed in like IE 10 or in IE 11 or something, right? That happens. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll create a block in Drupal and then put JavaScript in the head that will work in IE 11. And ideally you put a ticket in the backlog to fix it. That's like unmanaged risk because now we have a block with JavaScript in it, right? We manage it after the fact. Is it okay? Again, I would say that came down to the problem in a process, like Lee said before. Like there should have been a process in place to make sure that that worked beforehand. Now there was a lot of other factors that that impacted that thing. People were stressed, tired, panicking, whatever, but still in the end it's unmanaged risk and it was mitigated after the fact also uh i prefer it on a whiteboard or a local computer um i think there is a time and a space for it when gets on some really good examples there um yeah but being able to define it and then actually turning it into something that can be managed yeah it's key if you can't get to that point, we probably shouldn't be doing it. Or well, we should re re we should be reviewing what we're doing to spot those things earlier. Lee, yeah, uh, yeah, I was thinking about this one too. I, like, I, it feels, yeah, it doesn't sound right to agree that um, I do that our managed risk is fine. Like, it has to be. To me, it just feels like we've got to manage it, however, in whatever way, somehow possible. Like, if you're trying to especially in project management, like you're trying to bring stuff in on time with certain level of expectations and like, so whatever the problem might be, there has to be some kind of control somewhere there, which is, which could be just, do we need someone to work all night? Like, but I need, we need controls on that. Like you can't just have someone work indefinitely. Um, <clears throat> like at what point is a problem too much of a problem that more people need to get involved? Like there just has to be, there has to be some kind of a plan in there. Um, and even knowledge to, like, for us, it's for a client, like, you know, they might be demanding something has to go live at this time. And if it's just not ready or it's just not right, or there's, you know, that becomes their risk as well. Um, and so all I want to do is provide as much information and, and controls again as possible, which could just be, we'll work our asses off for the next three hours to your deadline. We, yeah. we, we, we think we can get it done, but like, man, we got, we're not sure, like, but here's, here's what we're going to do to do to do that. In the meantime, you should come up with a plan that says, sorry, but it's not going live or, you know, just in case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like I just would like to know what the, what the constraints might be on the just, let's just go for something and we'll pick up the pieces later. But that's, but I'm, you know, that's the position I'm in, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and I 100% agree with that. <laughs> um, it's my my baseline is talk to the developer like whatever the problem is what what do you want to do how are we going to fix this and then he gives me one or two solutions like you can do this or this and i go and talk to my manager and we make a decision that's my my minimal consultation so i suppose it is still managed even if it's only verbally 
And then afterwards I write it all down. We go, okay, this is what we're going to go and do. And I write it down, put it in a card, whatever it is. I'll put it in an email. But at least it's managed to the point where I've spoken to the developer and I've spoken to my manager. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's, you can't, I mean, I've been in that situation where you're sprinting, okay, give us this much time, we'll see if we can fix it. But the, the caveat is, okay, if we hit this point and we haven't done it, then this is what we do. Or we roll back. You yeah, know, so sometimes that, that solution yeah. of just let's just all dog pile on is half the problem as well. Like because yeah. we can't see the forest for the trees, no, we're under pressure. pressure. Yeah. So and but sometimes you don't know until you get into it. Yeah. So it's like, well, give us two hours, we'll see what we can do. If we don't get it done, we stop. Yeah. And then it doesn't go into production. So we'll we'll finish it properly tomorrow and we'll roll it out properly. So you know, but it, there's always a degree of management there. So <clears throat> For public service panelists, do you think the federal government is, uh, generally re uh, encourages or discourages risk taking? Uh, and what context is risk more accepted if it's controlled? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking no. <laughs> really, uh, you know, uh, many years, um, many different jobs and activities tell me it's probably no. Um, Not even in the creative space? <sighs> Yes, I th you know, I think on a creative space there is. Um, however, it really comes back to how your customers or stakeholders see what that creativity is. Most people don't see that when you're going, if you're doing it from a code perspective, they're more worried about how it visually presents on the screen or what do the content want to do. Now, again, they're very important aspects when we think about web development and you know, a lot of the stuff that we all sort of do, or at least people sort of sit in this room are focused on. Um, but they do still sort of draw this sort of almost line of, what is communications versus what is almost ICT. Now, to a degree, they are very, they're probably more closely aligned to ICT, yeah. but at the same time as well, I mean, they're all their own disciplines now. There's a lot of crossover, but still, I don't think it still fits that traditional model of ICT for a lot of things. Um, and I think that's where a lot of it comes from because everyone still feels like it's a bit of a, it's a bit too ICT when we don't know technical sorts of things. Within the constraints of a acceptance criteria, how do you delineate creativity from technically this is exactly what we want? That's a great, great question. I wish I had an answer for it. Uh, <laughs> I haven't found the magic bullet for that one. From my, from my time, um, being able to, well, once again, it's that open line of communication. It's, it's having a customer or a set of stakeholders who can sit there and talk to the problems. I want, you know, what can we move on? What can't we move on? Things like that. If you've got people who just want those sort of, I want this, I don't care, I just want it delivered, you're not going to get any movement against that. You're not going to get any different sort of series of acceptance. They're not fast. If you've otherwise got more open communication lines and you can talk people through those things and explain to them how this stuff works, you usually get more flexibility. It's not always the way, it's usually better time pressure or not enough resources. Um, yeah. Hello? It's difficult when you have senior stakeholders that are inflexible about the outcome. Yeah. So if you're just building a website, you're trying to design a website to usually where you start, you know, what do you, you get the requirements about what they're trying to accomplish, but I want this bit to do that or look like this. And all of a sudden you're locked into something that you've got to then work around because, and you go to them and you say, okay, in my experience, that's actually not the best solution my recommendation would be that you do it this way or we've got here a couple of others. No, 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 I want that. You know, so you, it makes it really hard then because if that's going to then cause problems elsewhere but they're completely immovable, then it presents a risk across the entire project then. So, yeah. and that's hard to manage. I have taught people around. Like I can be quite persuasive when I want to be. It's, but a, lot of, it's a lot of energy though. I think it that's, is a lot of energy. And you have to pick your battles. Like, again, using digital health as an example, we had to do penetration and load testing on the on the website for because we knew that when the opt-out period hit, we were going to get millions of people on the website at the same time. And we had some design questions that were going on and some other things, and I sat down with my manager one day and I said, right, here are the things I want to achieve. This is the thing that the penetration testing and the load testing was the most important that we had to get right. 
and we needed the infrastructure in place and we had to spend the money on the infrastructure with these guys to make sure that we didn't have another census. So that was our point of fail. So I caved or compromised on most of the other things because that was the thing I wanted to fight for and win, which I did. And, and at that point, it was the website had the most traffic that I've seen there seen at that point in time, which was pretty great. And the website didn't fall over. Yes. But it's you, I had to, like I had management saying, no, I want this bit to be this way. And so I went, okay, but I want that. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, yeah. A, it's an interesting series of lenses. I do a lot of initial sort of conversations with people who are considering coming to GovCMS. Um, because one, I've been on that customer side. I, I sat in that sort of seat for five or so years. Um, sometimes Toby responded, appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesus, shut the fuck up. Yeah, you know, I always got to throw one out there. Um, but um, so, so from that side, you know, I've been there, I've done it, so I've, I've gone from scratch, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And then when they come in and they ask, it, it really depends on who's in the room, what sort of capability and capacity they've got in the team. Some of our customers come in with that security uptime focus, and that's the only goal that they're after. Others come in and go, oh, we really want to do something really fun and creative. And that's usually then bound by well, how government executive go, oh, well, we can't be that, maybe we can't be that creative, or maybe we're worried we're going a bit too far with these sort of things versus we're trying to be talk to a serious topic. There's always a balance in that stuff too. But it, it's really interesting because you have that security folks who other people go, well, what's the dollar that mean? That's the only thing I'm focused on. Can we make sure that this gets delivered? And other people go, well, how restrictive is is your offer? What can we do? How far can we push it? it really, it's it's just this interesting gamut of all of these different audiences. I mean, it's government and sometimes it comes across really boring and I would totally agree with that. I've been around <laughs> it for so long. Um, but again, it's, it's still dealing with all of these customers that have their own desires, wants, needs, and interests or focus. So it brings me to a decision making model I was uh, doing a while back the can should must. Have you are you familiar with? Has that been useful to you? It sounds familiar for a country we don't like to talk about in a positive light at the moment. <laughs> um, um, I've used the uh, Moscow model in a couple oh, yeah. of things. Uh, that's yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So um so we use that on a couple of our things internally at the moment. Um, we do that with our team backlog, um, which just gives me more work. Um, we use it on our website backlog, which usually also gives me more work. Um, and I think we've trialed it in a couple of other spaces in sort of small projects, um, not so much other ongoing things that come behind the scenes. Um, it certainly is eye-opening, I think, for people who haven't gone through that process or say that their thing is very important when in the scheme of things it's not, or maybe it's really easy to tick off. Uh, Brett, that was called the Moscow model. Yeah. As far as I understand, that's what people uh, tell the, me. The other way Alistair referred to it, is it can something something? I haven't heard that before. That's what you said, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I think we all work to a similar thing. You've got three layers. Yeah. Nice to have some must haves and everything else falls in the middle. Uh, yep. Yeah. Cool. Moving on to the next question, with the private sector, do you feel that your clients encourage you to take risks and are willing to bet on risks by paying for your failed experiments. <laughs> is there a difference between public and private clients in their attitude towards experimentation and failure? Yeah, the, I reckon I got a wild opinion on that one, which is I don't think I just, so I don't think the private sector is way more gung ho than it sounds in terms of the safety or the whatever the, the, the perception of uh, public sector. Yeah, public sector. Um, it's just that they care about different things. So I've just, I've, in, in my experience, the um, public sector just, they care, they really, uh, they care about user outcomes and they protective of that. So they're less likely to want to push something or do something that might upset users and things like that. Plus there's, as we've mentioned earlier about the regulatory issues and there's lots of content that matters. Whereas private sector care more about the dollars that they're spending. So. Um, they might get more creative in that, but they, they're mostly watching the money part of it um, and they, they care about their bottom line. And like, so I guess, yeah, so I find it I find it kind of similar, but they care about different things. Um, there was a second part of that question. Uh, the difference between public and private attitudes towards experiment. Yeah, the experiment, yeah. So I guess like <laughs> maybe it's back to the negotiating and stuff. It's like we'll, we'll never frame anything as like a failed experiment. 
Um, but we'll definitely, I don't, I don't know, it's back to that, like, it's everything's everything's a lesson and you've learned something. So it's, it wouldn't necessarily be fa like failure. Like, we, we'll come up with an idea. We think it solves a user problem. Rather than just deploy it to thousands of people, let's use a test it. Turns out it didn't work. Like, to that, in a way, that would be a failure. Um, like, we had an idea. It turns out it doesn't work. That's that's the failure part. But actually, we learned something. It's not really a failure. We, we've saved we've saved on the back end by not building it or causing confusion to users on a live product or something like that. So I guess, I don't know, when you've got a client, whether it's public or private, who's willing to, like, think like that and and, and be, be ready to, like, care about whatever that MVP looks like, which is debatable, but, yeah, whatever that looks like or... Um, wherever they're trying to get back to the outcomes. Like if they're actually thinking bigger picture about this is actually what we need, this is the big picture thing we're trying to solve. All the other stuff's a bit of details. However we get there, it doesn't really matter. But as long as we solve the big problem, then um, they're good people to work with um, and partner with to to solve their, get, to solve their problems. Yeah. Rather than get caught in the weeds of like, mm -hmm. it's a form, it has to have 17 fields and should just be like your acceptance criteria, when we think we talked about acceptance criteria, like. You know, it should just be we need a form that captures like the acceptance criteria should, should be that we have a form that can capture enough data so that we can perform some action it shouldn't be have you got acceptance criteria have you got 17 fields does this one need validation that one needs validation. you know what i mean yeah that, that's i'm trying to leave that as space for the team to figure out like we would expect our team to go find out what's the what's the minimum information you need on that form what do we think is that what which bits need validation or don't need validation and work it out as part of the ticket. Yeah, won't be all over there. Anything <laughs> else to add to your boss? <laughs> <laughs> Great um, <one>. I heard. <laughs> um, I guess for me personally, <clears throat> I'm a bit more in the weeds with stuff. So it seemingly things are a bit more up for grabs when it comes to like per t on a per ticket basis, as opposed to like a per project basis like Lee's looking at like the, the grand scale of this we hope we deliver X by this point whereas for me it's more about like in this sprint I want to deliver X yeah. so my time frame is a lot a lot shorter and I still have like the grand vision in sight of like this is what it needs to be at the end but I guess my my things are more micro um, Your daily world smaller. Yeah, my yeah, my world is much smaller, and I can and I can have a bit, a bit of a different relationship with the client, for instance, than Lee does. So I'm in stand-ups with them, or I'm, you know, I'm at least seeing them at least once a week, every every week, and I'm maintaining a relationship on a personal level, I guess. So I get a, they get a better understanding and a feel for me, where I can say like, hey, we. We did this and it was all right. How about we try, or like we succeeded in this area where we kind of had a little risk. Now we have this other piece of functionality that you want and there's this other way that we could go about doing it. Um, and we think it'll be beneficial for you because it'll yield these better things in the end, better experience for you as the content manager or the front end will be lighter or we're removing tech debt or whatever it might be. Um, I guess when it comes down to like, it's easier for me to negotiate those things because like I can go on like a per day basis opposed to a, on this project we hope to achieve X. Um, the difference between like government and private, well, it's, I don't know, much of a muchness for me. I mean, I think we can probably all to some degree agree that government clients have a bit more restriction around the things that they're going to do or the things that they need to provide to the end user where like i mean some private company might come in and say i don't care about anyone that uses firefox or <laughs> anything right i just wanted to work in chrome <laughs> okay cool sick that's that's great for me as the like developer because i'm just like awesome i get to do like almost all the new cool things um where the government has a bit more, it's got to work for everyone actually. And you've got to make accessibility. Yeah, there's like lots of different yeah. rules. Like we would endeavor to always meet accessibility standards, no matter what the project is. And 
and we would always be trying to do best practice. But if a client comes to us with like some crazy thing that they want to build and they're like, it's only, it only needs to work in Chrome, then it makes sense to only build for Chrome. Like, but this is more work, right? Um, yeah. So in, in that regard, I guess there's a little difference, but I don't actually see that there's that much difference. Like I, I find that there's room for creativity working on government projects as well, if not more than regular projects, because you have to solve things in different ways. And it's nice to be able to like, I'm stuck inside this box. How can I operate? Yeah. Um, whereas like if I'm working on a private client that only needs Chrome, <laughs> hell for leather, right? <laughs> hell for leather, like just do whatever you want. Like lots of people, like it's an adage in, in our sort of sphere that like working within GovCMS can be a bit difficult because like we know what Drupal is outside of GovCMS. There's no restriction, all that kind of thing. But in if we like think about it a little bit differently, like there's a bit more creativity that goes into a Gov CMS site than there is a regular site because I'll just install a module. Sick. But maybe in Gov CMS I need to think of like these few ways to do this problem or solve this. And like I guess the creativity comes from a different part and like different things are up for grabs in different types of projects. Mm -hmm. And I'd go along with that, like with the Castle website, we're on a SaaS platform, but the developers that helped build the site or built the site, they got really creative in a couple of instances working within that SaaS platform, but coming up with some really great solutions for things that we needed to accomplish because we didn't have pass. So, and but they just worked with what they had and, and you know, figured it out. And that was pretty amazing. So it's good when you can. It feels good, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you finally solve this problem that like you've had on many other sites mm. before, and you just uh, now I have like this tool that I can take to the next site, or yeah. like anytime someone says I need this on my site, and we kind of go, oh, can we? Can't we? I'm like, well, I've done that before over here. Yes. And we did it this way. Like maybe we could tweak it a little bit every time. Yeah. Um, but when you but, work within a restricted framework. And you come up with something creative that does think outside that box and still works is pretty good. Yeah. What do you think could be done to encourage clients, both internal and external, uh, to back experimentation with either financial investment or personal investment? I think I'll go first on this one. It's easy for me. <laughs> um, I think from from my perspective. It, it really helps if you have that like trust built already. Like we've already delivered this many things. We did it all right. Now we're telling you that there's this other thing that you could have, but like you have this backlog of stuff to say like, we did this bit and now we just need you to like trust us a little bit. You trusted us with this, let us do this a little bit more. That, that bit just like it extends projects. They Clients might come back to you in the future and say, like, you did a really good job on this. We, we know that we had this difficult piece of technology and we had to work with that. And you guys did a really good job. So let's let's bring these people back in. Or you're halfway through the project and you kind of, you've established that bit of trust with the client and they they say, oh, we've just, we've just got this person. My boss above me said, I need this bit now. We go, well, maybe we need to change this and that. And they they kind of have that inherent trust with you already. And once that trust is built, like like anyone will tell you, it's easy to break trust. But if you're delivering and being transparent and honest all the time, people are people and they're reasonable. Um, and I think that that is the easiest way to make sure that like people are like backing your need to take risks or to innovate is by just delivering. <laughs> it seems simple, but I think that's so great. Great relationships, maintaining them. Well, being and authentic. Building on trust. Yeah, yeah. Authentic. being authentic, authentic with people. So if you drop your can, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. I drop my can. Yeah, I think. And that's, you're like, oh, you're a human. You dropped your can. Yeah, and owning the mistakes as, as well. Yeah. Like, oh, we tried this and it wasn't right. Like, I'll wear that and I'll do this to fix it. Or look, we did this wrong. Or we did this. This thing that we, this prototype we built, 
might not have been right for the situation or whatever, but we own that and like. I think some of that, just to your last bit, Perry, is framing around that. Yeah. I think, you know, oh, this library that we thought was going to solve this problem, you know, doesn't work or doesn't Run work. that problem for and, time. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, <laughs> good example. Right? Um, for some of those things, it's not necessarily a failure. It's like, okay, well, we'll pull another one down. It doesn't mean everything has fallen over in a heap. It's, yeah. it's a different story if you're servers on fire and your on-prem room and your backup sitting underneath it and it's never on fire too. That's more of a failure <laughs> in my mind. Whereas, okay, we tried this thing, now we're ideating or whatever cool words we use these days to talk about this sort of stuff. Part of that's just that journey. And I think people go, oh, well, it didn't work the first time, therefore it won't work if you change it this time. It's, it's just a, a bit of an evolution around those sorts of things. And okay, that didn't work, let's try this. We don't have to start again, we're still working on the problem. People invest in people, right? Yep. Not technology stuff. Yep. So, yeah. I think that's the main thing. <laughs> Hello. I think experimentation is fantastic as long as you've got the time to do it. And in my experience, I usually don't have the time. So, um, I mean, you, you, your three pillars of project management are time, resources, but it's all money. So, and you're usually short of one <laughs> or maybe two. So, but if you've got the time and the space to be able to have a play in a test environment, then absolutely go for it. And, and that's fun when you can do that and then show the client or your stakeholders, this is what we can accomplish. But it's you don't always have the capacity to do that. Yeah, I think I agree with everything there. Like I think definitely build trust um, is, the, is a major one because then, then, you, then you listen to it again, you know, we, we always find, well, of course I would say this, but I think we've got fantastic people with a lot of expertise and, you know, you've got fantastic people in the room looking to solve problems for you and you, you don't want to tell them what to do. You want to ask them how to solve a problem. So the quicker you can build that trust and, and people want to listen to you, then, you know, they're, they're, they can help you create that space to innovate. Um, but, yeah, the, the time is definitely tricky uh, and I, I think... Um, to, on that point, like I think the we, we just try to pick good like good guesses. Like if you if you if you show people um, that if you do spend a little bit of time here and you, and you get something get something from it, you can hopefully create a little bit of a culture where we want to do more of that. It's tr definitely tricky, but yeah, we just pick we try to pick one that where we think there's a high level of success and back to managing a risk. But the risk here we're going to we're going to experiment on something, but we think it can win, and we think that whatever the worst case scenario is, it's still a good thing. So therefore, maybe maybe in the next spring or maybe in the next month or whatever, we'd be able to do that again for, to, to create some extra bit of value, something like that. And I try and link it to something else. So mm. you can't always, but sometimes it's like, if you give us the time and space to do this bit, it's actually going to help us here. Yeah. Because yeah. it's going to make that easier and it will make that work better, yeah. which will then lead on to a better outcome for your end users. So yeah. if you can give them that kind of, like they can see the flow and where it's going and that helps. Okay, lastly, uh, do you believe the people with diverse backgrounds or minorities have a, a difficult time dealing with failure of how people perceive or present feedback and uh, what could be done within both private and public to help support this sort of innovation? I think, I think having a diverse team is a really great thing because every well and it's just people like right? every different person looks at something in a different way and there was a great advertising campaign in the uk a few years ago by hsbc where they said a different perspective is just the way you're standing so if you move from like from where i'm sitting it's different from where you're sitting and i really stuck with me because that's all it takes sometimes is just saying to someone just come and sit next to me and look at it from this side and but I think having a diverse group of people, their backgrounds all feed into their their experience and, and the way that they look at the world and whether they're from a minority group or from just a different country or they spoke a different language as their first language, everybody brings that life experience and it's all worth having. Yeah. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Helen. Um, I... <laughs> I think it's important we have everyone's voice available, visible, and can be heard and can share those sorts of things. Um, it's very hard for me to say 
yes otherwise because I'm not in those shoes or maybe in, in the circles I work with, maybe not so much. Um, but super important. Uh, I don't think we have enough of it. Yeah, absolutely. We want as many different opinions as possible. And I think it for me it fits in the same framework of the um of the providing safety. So it's like communication and provide safety for everyone. So what whatever your background, whatever your idea is, is if everyone's coming at it from a um like everyone's trying to look at every option in the most generous way, then that's the safety. So there's no problem coming in with different ideas and debating them healthily. Um some some ideas win out over other ideas, but you know, you want to encourage that debate because, um, again, you don't want, you know, five people in a team all with the same idea. You're not, you're not really going to innovate too much there. You want, you want people questioning things and, and questioning approaches um, and, and trialing stuff out. But, yeah, creating that safety for all of those different voices, I think, is important. Just, again, that you want to, the safety part being that you, you're not shredded for coming up with an idea that three other people didn't agree. <clears throat> Everyone's taken the most generous um, reading of, of your argument because we're all trying to solve the same problem. But Dick, as, as um, Al said, it's like giving everyone a voice. So when you're in a room, it's like if someone's not talking, if I'm running the meeting, I'll say, okay, what's your opinion? You know, you haven't spoken up yet. What do you think about what's going on? So it's pulling that person that might be a bit shy or a little bit less forceful as everybody else, pulling them into the conversation so they can be heard. Or, or even if it's not that, just making sure that they can be heard in something that's maybe more comfortable for them. Mm. Um, I, I know there's quite, of, of the group of us sitting up here, quite of us are quite loud <laughs> in general. So I'm... I'm oh, me. No, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Whispers over there. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, and also usually being the tallest person in the room. Um, I, I think I find that people do gravitate to me, do want to talk to me, um, and that's not the same experience for everyone else. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, we need experiences, we need people, and, and we need diversity because we need people who are going to use these products probably reflect the teams that are working on them. So. I don't think there's anything I can add that hasn't been said. Can you speak up a bit, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything I can say that hasn't already been said, Al. Well, fantastic. That brings us to the end of the creative questions. Uh, we now have time for questions from the audience. Final job. I'd like to go back to the, the concept of unmanaged risk and, and quote unquote cowboys and the general idea that if we take risk, we can fail. And if we fail, our organizations that we work for or that we partner with or that pay us to do work for them can regard that failure as uh, a negative. Do you think that there's a relationship between how much risk you take and how much innovation you might succeed in pulling off? Is there, a, is there more value in going to a client or a partner or a customer and saying, right, sorry, client and customer are the same thing, um, but going and saying, look, we want to try something bold, we want to try something big, and if we fail, uh, this is the ramification of that. Do we, do we aim higher and risk more in order to achieve greater innovation? I think the word failure doesn't sit right. That's a very good point. Like, if we take a risk and like, like you said, if we take a bigger risk, of course, there's higher chance of a higher reward, right? High risk, high reward, they kind of go together. But what you're saying is like these failures, I don't think they're failures, but they're just learned ways of not to achieve that thing. And that gives us like greater confidence going forward on if if that client came back to us and said, like, we know last time we, we learned these things, but we still want to give it another go. We now have this giant subset of stuff that we know we shouldn't touch with a barge pole, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. so I think failure is not the right thing, but I think you're right in the fact that Greater risk comes with greater reward. Usually, I mean, sometimes people take crazy risks and they're not. Yeah. Texting and driving, actually. <laughs> well, yeah. Not I, good rewards. I believe all knowledge is worth having, to quote mm. one of my favourite books. And I don't, I'm, 
agree that I don't think I don't think of things as failures. I think of it as okay, we took a risk, but look at what we've learned, look at what we've done. We now know this. Let's do it this way instead. Um, and and I just think regardless of the outcome, you've learned, and therefore that's worth it. So it's not a fail. Knowledge above all else for me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with someone going in and let's say, let's be bold, um, but you know, what's our contingency? Uh, um, you know, you, you can't necessarily throw $100,000 or a million dollars at something and not come out with anything or come out with the worst experience. You can. Well, I mean, you, you can. <laughs> okay, you, you, you can, you shouldn't. <laughs> you, you'd like to think you can actually build up from where you are on something like that. So um, it certainly feels a bit marketing when we say that sort of bold sort of statement. Um, the one that I used for a fair bit of a while, which I stole from uh, Chief Economist at IP Australia when I was still working over there, was the um, the gold, silver, bronze sort of setup where if we can aim for gold and we should start with gold, we should hit all of these things, having a couple of things against it as to what is the measure, what is the outcome, what is deliverable, and then having some lower grades of those to go, okay, well, if we can't hit gold because we've run out of time or we've run out of budget or whatever it happens to be, we can step down to something else. So we're still delivering something they're still, I mean, they still have an idea of where you're going. So whether or not you can achieve it is a different story, but it's something that they could then, you could then pivot to. Any more questions? I have one. We defined what risk was at the start of the conversation, but we didn't define what failure was. What is your opinion on that? What do you define as failure? No such thing. <laughs> from, a, from a project management perspective, I suppose if I had to define failure, and having just said I don't agree that anything is necessarily a failure, but if you're looking at it from I've got a set of requirements and a scope that I have to deliver against, if I don't meet those things, therefore the project has failed. Um, but then it's like, have I met some of those or have, have I missed all of them? Or, you know, what? where, where do you say at what point does something fail? And it's like when you look at requirements, you've got minimum, you always set a minimum deliverable. So it's like if you meet that, then you've, you've achieved it. So therefore it's not a failure. So, but then there's the minimum deliverable and what you actually want. So, which could be vastly different. Yeah, you work in that like pass fail or are you working in? A so it's your gold, AD. silver, bronze thing yeah, again. Yeah. You know, you aim for bronze, well, you're actually aiming for gold, but if you make, if you get a bronze, then you're okay. Yeah. One of the difficulties of an organisation pushing for risk taking is pushing for risk taking on a bed of a culture bred in a success. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So if like I've worked public service departments who should not be named, um, <laughs> the, the the very top is preaching risk, take risks, be bold. The bottom layer is saying we want to take risks and be bold. And you've got an entirely fat middle layer that's saying whoa, whoa, whoa. Like yeah. I'm, I'm measured on my success. Yeah, and unless you can convince executive to view the learning journey as success, yeah. you're really up against being able to implement any kind of risk-taking behaviour or embracing of a, a non-binary success failure outcome. Mm. Exactly. I think that's the hardest thing to do. Yep. Yeah. And using a very, very small example. Um, it's a 404 page on a website. I like 404 <laughs> pages that are really fun. They yeah, should be topical. They should be something that gets the user's attention and so that they know, okay, we, you haven't found what you're looking for. There are organisations out there in the world that have created some amazing 404 pages that are really cool. And every federal department I go into, I say, Let's have a bit of fun with this. Now the government's trying to be more human. You're trying to be more plain English. You're trying to like bring the you know people in and and join the party. No, we just wanted to say 404. Yeah. But it's it doesn't matter. It's a 404 page. <laughs> Some people may not understand what 404 means. Oh, sorry. 404 is the page that you hit when you no, can't mate, find the page. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that too. That's yeah. Really yeah. So if it just says 404 then they don't understand. You're absolutely right. So you need to put words around. Well, maybe you put a fun picture or a cartoon or a, you know, a little graphic or something. I was going to say, um, we did that once with the with industry in the consolidation project and our biggest gripe was, does Whoops have an H in it or not? 
<laughs> yeah, yes, well, for our biggest it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, so, well, I did at the time. I, I, I was I doing it wrong. Too. Yeah. But every department I've worked for, they've come back to a really conservative 404 page. And I'm like, why? why? It, it's a page that actually doesn't matter from a style perspective. It's like, just just have a bit of fun with No, no we're federal government, we have to be seen as serious. <laughs> anyway, it's just a very small thing. But it's that, it's just what the Tony experience. was saying. You've got, yes, we want to take risks, but no, we don't. <laughs> yeah. That sort of thing also contributes to experience and views on. Yes. I say just try it next time. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> yeah. do what you mean. Just Not do it. Like Unmanaged risk, <laughs> there you yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, you've managed it. It's only a 404 page. That should have been in the first place, probably, right? That's right. All the links work. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> just try it. Well, that concludes our panel. If there are no more questions, thank you for coming. Thank you. And let's all see you real quickly. Well, are there any questions? There were no online questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stop this. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, really no, but it's tempted really to comment a few times. <laughs> thank you, Brett. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you very much for joining in. Um, thank you. Just really quickly, just reiterating, December 8th, we've got the end of year drinks. If you can make it, please come along. Be sure to RSVP. Uh, and if you'd like to present or if you have another idea for something we can try uh, with future meetups, then please let Marge or I know. And finally, and most importantly, the credit for this idea that we executed tonight goes to Marge. Yay. Thank you very much, Marge. For the <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Well, Yes, we took a risk. Um, thank you very much to the panelists for coming along. Thank you, Carl, for being the moderator. You all did a fantastic job. So thank Thanks, you. Carl. And good night. Hang up, Marge. It'll stop recording. Not <laughs> If you hang up. Yeah.